Good afternoon. Welcome to the Paul Mellon Lectures. I'm Courtney J. Martin, the Paul Mellon Director at the Yale Center for British Art. And I'm delighted to welcome Kaywin Feldman, Director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, to our program today. Before we begin, may I ask you to please stay muted, which you will do throughout the program. This program will be recorded. We will also be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions. Your questions will be answered at the end of the program, but please feel free to submit them at any time. As always, closed captioning is available. Yale University and the Yale Center for British Art acknowledge that indigenous people and nations, including the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shigatacoke, Golden Hill Pogusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people populated the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. Established in 1994, this lecture series was named in honor of Paul Mellon, Yale College class of 1929. Mellon was a philanthropist, an art collector, and a founder of both the Yale Center for British Art here in New Haven, as well as the Paul Mellon Center for British Art Studies in London. Co-organized by both institutions, the biennial lectures were traditionally delivered in person by a specialist in British art at both the National Gallery in London and at the YCBA. This year's series, however, is a departure from the past. Entitled The Museum and Gallery Today, it is exclusively online and features talks by some of the world's most distinguished museum directors. Thus, we are pleased to welcome Kaywin Feldman. Born in Boston, Massachusetts, Feldman received a BA in classical archeology span from the University of Michigan, an MA in museum studies from the Institute of Archeology span at the University of London, and an MA in art history from the Courtauld Institute of Art also in London. In 2019, she became the fifth director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and is the first woman to hold this distinguished position. Prior to joining the gallery, she led the Minneapolis Institute of Art as its Niven and Duncan McMillan director and president. She is currently a trustee of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the White House Historical Association, and the Chipstone Foundation. She is also a member of the Hermitage Museum's International Advisory Board. In her distinguished career, she has been a president of the Association of American Art Museum Directors and a past chair of the American Alliance of Museums. She has lectured widely and published numerous articles on reinventing the museum for the 21st century. The title of her lecture today is Building a National Collection in a Changing Nation. Please join me in welcoming Kaywin Feldman. Thank you so much, Courtney. That's a very kind and warm introduction. And I am delighted to be with you today. I am going to get started. My history with the National Gallery of Art began when I was just 12 years old, attending school outside Washington, DC. Every year, my junior high school French teacher brought us to the National Gallery to study French painting. Mademoiselle Trimbach was bound and determined to instill an understanding in cranky and rather disinterested teenagers that art and culture were integral to the study of language and therefore of people. Mademoiselle Trimbach died of cancer years ago at the age of just 51, and I never had the opportunity to thank her for setting me on my path, literally showing me my future even though I didn't know it at the time. And so I dedicate my talk to her today. While considering the opportunity at the gallery, I asked a mentor for advice. I told him that I had always worked at museums that were deeply embedded in a single community 
and that I didn't know how to approach a federal institution. Richard leaned forward and said with excitement, yes, but the nation becomes your community. And what does that mean? My eyes lit up, I love an opaque challenge. In my time with you today, I'd like to think about how in its development, the National Gallery has responded to contemporary society locally and nationally, and how we might do so in today's volatile and complex world. My story has three chapters, and we start in the early part of the 20th century. Like the Yale Center for British Art, the Mellon name stands at the origin of the National Gallery. Our founder, Andrew W. Mellon, made his fortune through banking and investments in industrialization. He was raised in Pittsburgh, where he met men like Henry Clay Frick, who introduced him to European art. After marrying an English woman, Nora McMullen, he developed a particular love for British art and culture, an affection sustained by his children. President Warren G. Harding tapped Mellon to serve as Secretary of the Treasury, and he worked under three presidents, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. During his service, he navigated payments of World War I debts, multiple taxation proposals, the construction of federal buildings, and the Great Depression. Out of favor after 11 years in office and facing possible impeachment, in 1932, Hoover offered Mellon a graceful exit with the position of ambassador to the court of St. James. Mellon began quietly communicating to his family his interest in founding a National Gallery of Art, modeled on the National Gallery in London. And in 1936, he wrote to President Roosevelt, suggesting that America needed such a gallery and offering to donate his collection and the necessary funds to build it. The gift was accepted by the president and Congress and work began on the John Russell Pope designed building in 1937. Tragically, Mellon died that year after seeing only the building's foundation. And in a weird twist of fate, Pope, the architect, died the day after Mellon. The construction of the 500,000 square foot building cost Mellon $15 million, which is about 280 million in today's money. And within four weeks of its opening in 1941, we welcomed 1 million visitors. During the museum's dedication, President Roosevelt said that, quote, to accept this work today for the people of this democratic nation is to assert the belief of the people of this democratic nation in a human spirit, which now is everywhere endangered and which in many countries where it first found form and meaning has been rooted out and broken and destroyed. At the time, Europe was embroiled in the Second World War, and just nine months after the United States entered the conflict. During the same month of the speech, that's March 1941, Hitler authorized the expansion of Auschwitz, and Britain suffered heavy bombing by the Luftwaffe. It moves me profoundly that during some of humanity's darkest hours, the President and Congress recognized that art would be central to our free democracy and to the sustenance of the human spirit. This belief continues to guide our work today. In his gift, Mellon demonstrated the importance of a big vision. He created a building so large that we occupied less than 40% of it with art. His hypothesis that American generosity would soon fill the galleries has proven true. We opened with 546 works, and 80 years later, we hold over 155,000 works of art in trust for the nation. Mellon embodied generosity. He gave his collection and the money to build the building, but insisted that his name not be on the building. Given the benevolence of the Mellon family, Andrew and his children, Paul and Elsa, this could legitimately be called the Mellon Gallery of Art. But Mellon envisioned an institution dedicated to Americans, celebrating our people and our collective promise. 
how grand marble clad neoclassical museum buildings are often criticized today for being intimidating and elitist. I believe, however, that Mellon's gesture was truly populist. He believed that all people, regardless of background, education, or social standing, deserve magnificence. He wanted to re reward the industriousness and nobility of his fellow Americans, past and future. And he ensured that we would always be free of charge. With the elevated entry, the voluminous rotunda, marble halls, and garden courts, Mellon gave a gift to the American people that he felt they deserved and that would inspire the very best in them. Our founding Mellon collection included 126 paintings and 26 sculptures. And today, roughly 70% of Mellon's collection remains on view, which is a real testament to his superb eye. Madonna and Child on a Curved Throne, a 13th century Byzantine painting, is listed as the gallery's very first work in our collection and is one of our oldest paintings. Following the Fourth Crusade in 1204, many icons were brought to Italy from Byzantine sanctuaries in Greece and Constantinople. Here we see the abstracted style of these icons, the gold striations that define folds in the clothing, the round volume of Mary's veiled head, and the frontal pose of Jesus, who of course looks more like a miniature adult than a child, are all part of the Byzantine tradition. Because their subject is not the temporary appearance of the physical world, but a holy and infinite presence, icons avoid direct references to earthly reality. Mellon never intended to collect any school of painting in a comprehensive fashion, but to stud the crown with singular jewels. Favorites of mine include Holbein the Younger's Edward VI, a portrait of Henry VIII's only legitimate male heir, who at the age of just two already appears formidable and ready to command an army. I'm also fond of Vermeer's radiantly beautiful Girl with a Red Hat, one of four paintings by Vermeer in the collection. This fashionable woman has just turned in her chair and is about to speak to us. Mellon, the Anglophile, collected British paintings from the very beginning, acquiring these masterworks by Turner and Constable. Working through a variety of middlemen, starting in 1929, Joseph Stalin began selling works of art from the collection of the Hermitage to finance Russia's industrialization. Mellon acquired 21 paintings for a total price tag of $6.6 .6 million, which is 133 million in today's money. And just to highlight a few of the masterpieces he brought from, bought from Stalin, the sale included the famous Tondo by Raphael, known as the Alba Madonna, painted around 1510. Unlike the ethereal Byzantine Madonna perched high upon a gold throne, here we see the Madonna seated firmly on the ground. The delicate colors, idealized landscape, and harmonious proportions are classically Renaissance. Mellon also purchased this beautiful masterpiece by Titian, Venus with a Mirror. Stand out in his oeuvre, this painting remained in Titian's collection on his death, nearly 20 years after he painted it. In the galleries, I always stop to admire one of Botticelli's rare multi-figure complex compositions, the Adoration of the Magi. Stalin apparently said that he didn't mind selling these works to the Americans, as he knew the works would return when the US became a part of the Soviet empire. The other significant gift at the time of our opening was artwork given by Samuel H. Kress. Kress, who made his money from five and dime stores, decided that since he had earned his money from the nation, he would give back to the nation. He and his foundation gave his collection of 3,500 old master works to American museums. The lion's share came to the National Gallery. And when we opened in 1941, nearly three quarters of the works on view were gifts or loans from Kress. Italian paintings form 70% of our Kress collection and mostly from the Renaissance. I always visit this stunning and rare painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds by Giorgione. It is an excellent example of the innovative deployment of high quality color in Venetian Renaissance art. 
In fact, recent research from colleagues in conservation science revealed the use of glass in the red lake paint used in the Virgin's mantle. In the cross section, you can see that Giorgione applied red lake underpaint below the ultramarine blue layer. The shadows on the Virgin's mantle were formed with a top layer of translucent purple paint, creating a deeper color that would, a deeper color than would a simple darker blue. I'm a big fan of the Florentine artist known as Bronzino, and the Crest Collection includes two of his paintings, this highly mannerist early holy family and a later portrait of the elegant Eleonora of Toledo, the first wife of Cosimo de' Medici and regent of Florence during Cosimo's frequent absences. Not all the Crest paintings are Italian and favorites of mine from other European schools include El Greco's weird and ethereal Leahuan. The subject of Leahuan and his son struggling against serpents sent by the gods to punish him after became, be, became popular after the discovery in 1500 of an ancient sculpture in Rome. Everything about this dynamic painting communicates doom and agony for Leahuan and his sons. Although perhaps not as gloomy, but filled with doom, is Hieronymus Bosch's Death in the Miser. As a kind of macabre room service, death reaches around the door for the miser, and we see a creature under the bed curtains offering the miser a bag of money. An angel kneeling at the right is hopefully pointing out the crucifix in the window. So as death calls, our poor miser is torn between a final path of good and evil. Let this all be a lesson to us all. When we opened, we had fewer than a dozen American paintings. As you can see on the screen, they were sparsely displayed in just three rather empty galleries. Our early ambivalence towards American art reflected the gallery's founding view that European painting was the pinnacle of artistic achievement. It is also likely that Mellon always envisioned a small national collection with singular masterpieces instead of a representative assemblage of American art. In 1948, the gallery's director, John Walker, articulated the need to collect American art, saying, quote, by our selection, we have sought to prove that galleries hung with the greatest of American paintings can hold their own with galleries filled with the best European work of the same periods. Therefore, the few American works we acquired were by artists who painted in the European manner, such as Gilbert Stewart and Benjamin West. There was also a preference for historical figures and events. So on to chapter two. While Andrew Mellon's children, Paul and Elsa, shared his big vision, boundless generosity, and commitment to excellence, they also recognized the need for the museum to be of its time and to serve the needs of contemporary audiences. In fact, during Paul Mellon's speech at the 1941 dedication, he stated, it was my father's hope and it is ours that the National Gallery would become not a static, but a living institution, growing in usefulness and importance to artists, scholars, and the general public. So what did it mean to be useful to Americans during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s? This period was the height of the Cold War, a time of ideological and political struggle between the Western and Eastern blocs. The United States and her allies created NATO and promoted a global policy of containment. It was a war fought with propaganda, espionage, sports rivalry, and of course the space race. And culture fit into the rivalry and patriotism of the time. One of the gallery's most historic moments was the loan of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa from the Louvre in 1963. This special one picture loan was made directly to the president of the United States and the American people by the president of France. All arrangements were handled by the White House and the Mona Lisa traveled aboard the SS United States. The painting was installed on a baffle draped in red velvet 
and was guarded around the clock by United States Marines. It was truly a diplomatic event. In a month, over half a million people viewed the picture, each person given just four seconds to look. Gallery trustee Darren Walker recalls that his first exposure to the National Gallery occurred in elementary school as his class watched black and white newsreel of Jackie Kennedy hosting the Mona Lisa. And four years later, with funds from Elsa Mellon Bruce, the gallery acquired a Leonardo painting of its very own, the renowned portrait of Ginevra da Benci. The daughter of a wealthy Florentine banker, the portrait, the only painting by Leonardo in the Americas, was probably commissioned about the time of her marriage at age 16. The picture was quite revolutionary, showing a confident teenager in an open setting, turned in a three-quarter pose and looking at us. At some point, the panel was cut down, but we don't know why or when. Ginevra's face is framed by the spiky evergreen leaves of a juniper bush. Juniper refers to her chastity, the greatest virtue of a Renaissance woman, and is also a pun on her name, since the Italian for juniper is Ginepro. The Department of Conservation Science has thoroughly researched the work and discovered what we assume to be Leonardo's fingerprint in the paint of the juniper bush. So our American collection has grown slowly and steadily through the years. While the European collection was formed in large part by single donors giving a substantial number of works, the American collection consists largely of donations, smaller in number of total works, but great in magnitude. In 1950, we quadrupled the galleries for American art and started to add gems to the collection, including Winslow Homer's Breezing Up, perhaps the first American painting purchased directly by the gallery. Homer had only been dead about 30 years when we bought the picture. So this was not only a rare American purchase, but a contemporary purchase. And in 1945, we were given George Innes's luminous Lackawanna Valley. Commissioned by the railroad president, the picture offers a realistic view of Pennsylvania's Lackawanna Valley, celebrating both the beauty of American landscape and the advancement of American industry with a steam train and distant roundhouse. Interestingly, the first large gift of American art acquired by the gallery came in 1954, a collection of American folk art from Edgar and Bernice Garbisch. Records of the time show that we accepted the collection, then called naive art, to show what American talent looked like before being educated by European art. Press release of the time, referring to the artists as primitive and the artwork as indigenous, describes the collection as demonstrating, quote, that the fledgling United States had produced a style of its own one that owed little to the conventions of European art. Curators and I continue to scratch our heads about the decision to accept this large and rather uneven collection. The aesthetic of folk art was very out of keeping for the gallery at that time. We assume it was intended to be a populist gesture. Historically, the National Gallery collection did not include works by Native American artists. We have about 600 works of Native American people by white artists, including 350 paintings and drawings by George Catlin. I find the lacuna of Native American art problematic. If we are the nation's collection of American art, and we do not include work by Native American artists, we are in a sense saying that we do not consider them to be American. We've begun to add contemporary works by Native American artists including this powerful collage by John Quick to see Smith, Target I See Red, and installations by James Luna. These works challenge Native American stereotypes and museum categories. In fact, the Quick to see Smith hangs powerfully in a gallery with artists like Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol, irrefutably holding its own. This period did not only see geopolitical tension with the Cold War, but also strain at home. The Vietnam War, 
the civil rights struggle, and the assassinations of President Kennedy, Dr. King, and Robert Kennedy brought protest and produced counterculture. How might a national gallery respond to this period? These images of Vietnam War protesters sleeping in the gallery just warm my heart. They also make me think of these photos taken in 1941 of servicemen resting at the gallery. So clearly part of our role as a national gallery is to provide respite when citizens participating in democracy just need a break. It was a difficult period for Washington, D.C. Civil unrest and economic recession strained the city. And in 1975, the Richmond Times-Dispatch published an editorial calling Washington, quote, the sickest city in the nation. Due to high infant mortality, inadequate public health services, high crime rate, and poorly performing schools. Richard Nixon liked to say that DC stood for disorder and crime. Three magical elements coalesced at this moment to enable the gallery to respond to the times. A spot of vacant land reserved for the gallery's future growth. The philanthropic commitment of Paul Mellon and Elsa Mellon Bruce to pay for a new building and fill it with more masterpieces and the appointment of a charismatic populist director, J. Carter Brown. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy had asked architects working on designs for Washington to design, quote, a setting in which men and women can fully live up to their responsibilities as free citizens. And in 1978, the National Gallery opened the East Building designed by I.M. Pei located immediately across from the United States Capitol. It was designed to fill this public mandate. Pei and Brown conceived of an institution to embody the democratic spirit, a building in which all people could feel both welcome and comfortable. Like Mellon's West building, the East building was envisioned as a special place to elevate visitors beyond their routine concerns. Brown stated that he wanted to, to take people by the lapels architecturally, insisting that their visit was not a normal moment. Ahead of his time, Brown knew that when visitors arrive, museum architecture can help them to transition away from stress in the mundane world and open them up to wonder. Still admired today, the soaring and light-filled modernist atrium was an innovative feature of the 1960s and 70s, found in shopping malls, corporate headquarters, and hotel lobbies built at that time. And from its very beginning, the atrium was intended to be an open, active, and welcoming town square. It was also a deliberate contradiction of the rigid enfilade and hierarchical approach of the West Building. As a deliberate populist gesture, we offer visitors more options for routes around the galleries and open spaces, along with greater transparency. And in contrast to the voluminous lobby that you see, Pei and Brown conceived of intimate galleries intended to give the feel of historic house museums. Pei's modernist expression was to be a timeless symbol of participatory American democracy. At the dedication of the East Building on a steamy June day in 1978, President Carter, referring to the building as, quote, an emblem of our national life, said, this building tells us something about ourselves, about the role of art in our lives, about the relations between public life and the life of art, and about the maturing of an American civilization. The impetus for the East Building was the desire to create an academic center of learning that would foster scholars and scholarship during a time when the demand in universities for scholars in the humanities was high. More people were going to college and World War II radically altered the American worldview, making the arts and humanities a more popular area of study. Paul Mellon and Carter Brown founded the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts as a sort of Art History University located within the museum. 
its original remit was largely European art scholarship. But in recent years, its focus has become more global and interdisciplinary. The other need served by the East Building was gallery space for special exhibitions. The 1976 King Tut exhibition started the museum blockbuster race and the National Gallery sprinted at the head of the pack. To this day, some of our most well-attended exhibitions occurred during Carter Brown's leadership. King Tut, Treasure Houses of Britain, circa 1492, and George O'Keefe. While packing to come to DC, I found this photo taken 35 years ago at the gallery when college friends and I traveled here from Ann Arbor to see the O'Keeffe show. Brown recognized that the gallery's European and American focus limited the museum's ability to represent the global world and to attract those hidden treasures exhibitions that were touring at a time when the art of distant lands was becoming more accessible. The end of the Cold War increased global travel and our explosive digital world mean that these blockbuster sort of hidden treasure shows are no longer the audience bait that it was. Today, we're thinking differently about the exhibition program, telling new stories and creatively mining the collection. I also believe that the climate crisis will result in reduced exhibitions for all of us due to the significant carbon footprint of many of these shows. And now bringing us up to the present. For most of our history, modern and contemporary art was just not a priority for the gallery, due in part to the concern that modern art can be political, potentially upsetting Congress. The reluctance also reflected a need to be cautious about acquiring artists whose importance had not yet been established by the test of time. The board ruled that an artist had to be dead for at least 20 years to be in the collection. This started to change when Impressionism and Post-Impressionism collector Chester Dale joined the gallery's board. After Dale bequeathed his desirable collection, New York Times art critic John Kennedy wrote, the Dale collection has thrown the whole National Gallery out of kilter, and a good thing it is too. The place had too much kilter and too little accent. The Dale collection included several of Picasso's masterpieces, such as his Rose Period Family of Saltenbank from 1905. At the time of the bequest, Picasso was still enjoying his long life. So we eliminated the death requirement and gratefully accepted the Picasso paintings. If any artist is going to cause you to change your policies, Picasso's the one. The East Building enabled the gallery to begin to pursue a collection of modern art. And we hired our first curator of modern art in 1974. The first opportunity was to manage five major commissions in the East Building of singular works by Alexander Calder, Juan Miro, Anthony Caro, Robert Motherwell, and Henry Moore. At this time, we purchased Jackson Pollock's painting Lavender Mist, one of the artist's most important drip paintings. Painted in his barn studio on Long Island, he laid the canvas on the floor and using common house paint, he poured, dripped, and flung paint across the surface. The acquisition was a bold move for the gallery and the work remains one of our most important modern paintings. In embracing modern and contemporary art, the gallery also became a prime location for artists and foundations to locate large bodies of an artist's work. As early as 1949, Georgia O'Keeffe donated over 1,600 photographs by Alfred Stieglitz, forming what O'Keeffe called the key set. It includes work made between 1886 and 1937. The curious part of the gift is that we were not collecting photography or modern art at that time. But O'Keeffe recognized that a national gallery was the perfect location for the preservation, publication, and in-depth study of Stieglitz's work. 
In fact, we didn't establish a curatorial department of photography until 1990. Since then, many other photographers have joined Stieglitz with large collections, including Ansel Adams, Robert Frank, Dorothea Lang, Robert Adams, Walker Evans, Ilsa Bing, and Lee Friedlander. Another major milestone in the gallery's expansion into modern art occurred in 1986 when the Rothko Foundation donated over 1,000 paintings and works on paper by Mark Rothko. The gift included expansive research materials, thereby ensuring that the National Gallery would forever remain the primary center for research about the artist's work. We lend Rothko paintings all over the world, mount special exhibitions, and publish research. In fact, in 2023, we will be mounting a breathtaking show focused on Rothko's works on paper. I hope you'll come and see it as you will find it filled with surprises and arresting moments. Washington's oldest museum, the Corcoran Gallery, founded in 1869, closed its doors permanently in 2014 after years of financial struggle. The loss is still painful here as the Corcoran was always scrappier and more embedded in the local artist community than the federal museums. We aided in the redistribution of the defunct Corcoran's collection with 10,000 works coming to the gallery and another 10,000 distributed to regional museums. The impact has been significant. It is the single largest infusion of American art in our history with iconic works by artists like Albert Bierstadt, Thomas Cole, and Frederick Edwin Church. Here I show Church's famous Niagara painting, which helped to cement his reputation as a significant artist. Widely considered one of America's greatest landmarks, no artist had managed to capture the immediate force and wonder of Niagara. It is as though the viewer stands right on the edge of the falls, missing only the thunder and spray. The Corcoran Collection has also expanded the gallery's ability to tell the story of contemporary art, especially with work by women and Black artists. The gift included three joyous works by the important African-American painter from DC, Alma Thomas, who the city recently celebrated. And this transcendent four panel painting by Joan Mitchell, Salut Tom from 1979. As I look towards the future of the National Gallery under my tenure, I think about a return to our founding words and mission to serve and represent the entire nation with generosity, vision, and a commitment to excellence. I am inspired every day by the words of our founders who while rooted in their own time, dreamed of a museum that would always grow and change, expanding in its usefulness. The gallery's original charter instructs that the collection must be maintained at a high standard of quality, a quality similar to that of the donor, Andrew Mellon. Not everybody defines quality or excellence in the same way especially when it comes to art. While we like to think that excellence is objective and, and immutable, it can be subjective and always changing along with taste. The challenge and opportunity of this lofty goal is that it must always be interrogated and we have to continually stretch to achieve it. In Andrew Mellon's world, an excellent museum was an institution of exceptional European old masters. While we will always regard our collection of old masters as extraordinary and core to our mission, there are additional qualities that enable a museum to be the standard bearer of excellence. And today, an excellent museum must be a diverse and inclusive museum. You cannot simply exclude women artists and artists that are black, indigenous, people of color and be excellent in America. In the last census, women made up 50.8% of the population and people of color represent 40% of the population. And yet the artists in our collection remain 90% white and male. We're excited to expand our collection in these areas so that the gallery can better represent great American artists today and in the future. Since 2000, the gallery has made leaps in expanding the collection with work by African-American artists. Significant additions include Kerry James Marshall, Great America, 
in which the artist reimagines a boat ride into the haunted tunnel of an amusement park as the middle passage of enslaved people from Africa to the New World. Glenn Ligon's untitled I'm a Man references the 1968 sanitation worker strike, which fatefully brought Dr. King to Memphis. Ligon's iconic work powerfully reminds us of the deaths of the two sanitation workers, as well as that of Dr. King. Just one month ago, the gallery acquired one of Faith Ringgold's most important and iconic paintings, The Flag is Bleeding, from the American People series. Ringgold, who just celebrated her 91st birthday, created this mural-sized painting in 1967, the year before King's murder. For Ringgold, the flag was a truly subversive symbol, and she used it to communicate her experience as a Black woman in America. Ringgold's visceral imagery raises more questions than it answers. The Black man holds a knife, yet does his wound suggest his vulnerability? Is the white man in a suit his adversary? Is the white female figure an arbiter of peace? And why is there no African-American woman present? Is the painting about unity or about division? In addition to the Ringgold, we've recently acquired other work by women artists, including Katerina Fritsch's Blue Rooster, titled Han Kok. Affectionately known as the Big Blue Bird, the sculpture stands on our, west, on our East Building Terrace, keeping watch over Capitol Hill. About eight months before Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, she told me that looking up at the Fritsch was her favorite part of the commute to and from the Supreme Court. And while sitting at my desk shortly after she died, I noticed a motorcade heading along Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol. I realized it was RBG and that she would pass by the rooster one last time on her way to Arlington. Nearly three years into my tenure, I'm still thinking about how we might be a museum whose audience is the broad swath of humanity that is the American people. How can one institution with a distinct history and rooted in a specific location truly reflect and attract over 300 million people? It's an even more complicated question today than it was in 1941 when we opened. American demographics have changed from a nation that was 90% white in 1941 to just 60% white today. And in another 20 years, our nation will be majority people of color. These changes are exciting and filled with opportunity to further our service. Today's global world is filled with volatility and uncertainty sometimes leading to painful polarization, which one sees clearly in Washington. We retreat into our corners, ignoring nuance and the gray area between opposing points of view. But art museums are all about that complex gray area because we're all about people. Art is complicated and messy because people are complicated and messy. Art museums are institutions of paradox. At the end of the day, a very small group of people initiate, shape, and sustain our institutions in service of a greater good for the masses. Now I'm gonna end my talk today with one final collection story that I believe sums up what makes an American National Gallery distinctive. It is the story of Dorothy and Herbert Vogel. Herbert, who died in 2012, was an employee of the US Postal Service and Dorothy worked as a reference librarian. The Vogels lived modestly in New York on Dorothy's salary and spent Herbert's entire salary buying art. They started collecting in the 1960s, focusing largely, but not exclusively, on drawing. Ultimately, they assembled a collection of 4,000 works, all of which shared their 450 square foot, one bedroom apartment, along with eight cats and 20 turtles. In just four decades, they assembled one of the most important private art collections of the 20th century, stocking their tiny apartment floor to ceiling with Chuck Close sketches, paintings by Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Mangold and Pat Steer, and sculptures by Saul LeWitt and Carl Andre, to name only a few. True public servants, the Vogels gave their collection to the National Gallery 
because they were inspired by our free admission and national purview. It took five 40-foot trucks to move the art to Washington. To date, the gallery has received almost 1,000 works and aided the Vogels in distributing 2,500 works of contemporary art to museums throughout the nation. I'm delighted to say that Dorothy visited us just last week and toured the Linda Benglis exhibition, assembled largely from their gift. The Vogels lived frugally. They denied themselves so much so that they could support artists and museums. And they selected the National Gallery as the permanent repository of their collection because they admired the museum's commitment to making art accessible to everyone. Which brings me back to Andrew Mellon, a man of another era whose lived experience had little similarity to that of the Vogels. And yet he was motivated by the same patriotism, generosity, and belief in human nobility. To conclude, I cannot help but note that the global pandemic has made the subject of the shared humanity referenced by President Roosevelt during the Second World War ever more urgent. I will never forget the early days of the pandemic when Italy went into full lockdown and we watched videos of Italians singing to each other across balconies and using household appliances to make music. My favorite was a shaggy haired young man who joyfully played the burners of his stove as though he was a DJ in a nightclub. And what I carry away from it, besides their humor, was the expression that we were all in this unfamiliar struggle together, using art, culture, and our shared humanity to carry us through a time of fear and tragedy. I close with my favorite word after the last 18 months, onward. Thank you. Kaywin, thank you so much for what an inspiring talk. Um, I have to say that that each time I hear about the Vogels and um, the, their life work of knowing artists, collecting artists, being in dialogue with uh, the art of their time, um, I'm inspired by it. And I find that um, you seeing those images of the cramped apartment with all, with all of that art, um, perhaps as a, as a former New Yorker, I look at it and think, what a wonderful way to live. Uh, <laughs> Um, Including the uh, 20 turtles and eight cats? Maybe I could live without the cats and the turtles, but the art, definitely, definitely. Um, we have some very good questions for you. I would uh, like to start with a question that I think, um, you know, really does hit right to something that you uh, suggested about um, looking at the, the lack of native artists in the collection. Um, Natalia asked, how much of a priority is it for the gallery to collect objects from local indigenous tribes that are not contemporary? Um, and then as a follow-up to this, she asked, as the director, are all new acquisitions approved by you? Um, uh, the easy answer is to the second question, which is yes. Um, uh, it's one of the um, uh, parts of my job that I uh, delight in the most. Um, I often criticize museums for, for, for their pace of growth and expansion, that we're constantly more, 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 more art, more galleries, more funding, more staff. And I am the most acquisitive of all of them. So I'm an exactly an example of some of the problems, I think, of, of um, unchained museum growth. Um, so I do love that part of the process. The Native American question um, is one that, I, to be honest, we're still um, trying to figure out. I suspect that as we go forward, we will think more about a borrowing work from our wonderful collegial institutions. We have the National Museum of the American Indian right across the mall from us, uh, as well as perhaps other institutions in America. Um, and we want to thoughtfully think about um, how to integrate a bit more Native American art um, as we tell the story of American art. And, um, and contemporary art is probably where we'll actually uh, further grow the collection, but not necessarily in historic material um, at this point. Great. Um, you know, Washington DC for me always seems like such an interesting city because it is, you know, it's, it's, it is both local and national and international at the same time. And so we have a question here um, from Simon Timms that I think hits right into that. 
He asks, how is the, the National Gallery approaching the issue of giving citizens a greater say in which new acquisitions it should add to the national collection? And, and can I ask you as a sort of add on to his uh, question, who exactly is the citizenry um, that is your local? Is it the citizens, you know, the people of the city of, of DC or is there another constituency? Yeah, when we think about um, our local audience, um, as some of you may know, we have the um, quaint phrase where we refer to ourselves as the DMV um, and not the Department of Motor Vehicles, but the District, Maryland and Virginia. So, um, you know, that's certainly that, that broader area is our um, local community. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I actually pointed out shortly after I arrived here that I, there was what I would refer to as a very healthy tension between national and local. And um, we very much want to serve both audiences. And of course, a lot of what we do automatically does serve both audiences, but not necessarily all. So part of our current strategic plan is really thinking about as we move forward, how we're going to do that. And um, an amusing um, thing that happened early in my tenure was the wonderful moment of the Nationals winning the World Series. And as it looked like they're going to win, I emailed the team and I said, what are we gonna do? How are we going to celebrate? And I was told, oh no, you know, we can't celebrate the Nationals. We're the National Gallery and we support all teams. That would be showing favoritism. And I said, yes, but you know, this is once in a generation, you know, go Nats. And, um, and I'm delighted to say we, we did pull together and there was a ticker tape parade that we participated in. So it was very joyous. So it, it is something that we're um, constantly figuring out. Um, and of course it ultimately becomes a resource question and how much of our staff time and resources are we thinking about uh, local programming versus national. And as I know, um, Courtney, all of you, uh, experience with the pandemic, um, you know, museums, I think, did learn in the pandemic that there's so much more we can do with um, digital to serve a broader audience in a, in a more effective way. So I think we'll see all museums really expanding in that, that part of their work. Okay, when uh, Suzanne Desjardins asked, what surprises you about going from uh, a museum in Minneapolis to the National Gallery? Um, and then she also asked, do you see more international collaborations rather than um, big blockbuster shows in the States? Um, I, I, I do see, I would actually say more collaboration period. So yes, absolutely international. Although the gallery already does so much internationally and I'm very proud of the um, generosity um, that the gallery takes in lending works of art around the world. We always start with the answer yes, and unless there's something that precludes yes, I like the condition of a work we do lend, um, but also thinking about other types of partnerships. That's of course not the, the only kind of, of partnership. We also wanna look at how we might do it uh, more uh, nationally as well. And, um, and I do think that um, it's an interesting time for thinking about exhibitions and, um, I, I, I'm having a lot of fun with the curators right now talking about different kinds of um, moments that we can do in the galleries because we have such an extraordinary collection that um, we're excited about perhaps having, you know, conversations in the galleries between a contemporary work and a historic work or between um, two different parts of the collection. And so um, I wanna really put a lot of thought behind um, um, those sorts of installations as well as continuing to do um, exhibitions, but, but with a change to the approach on exhibitions. Um, and back to, to Susan's first question about um, what, what are your surprises from moving from Minneapolis to DC? Um, the, of course, you know, one is the weather. I, I, I drove out of Minneapolis in um, the first of March, I think, and it was minus six degrees in Minneapolis. And I arrived in DC and it was 60. And uh, I uh, packed my, uh, my giant, giant coat and snow boots away. Um, so I'm enjoying DC weather. Needless to say, it's, a, it's very different um, being a part of the federal government 
and it's it's an honor and a joy and also uh, incredibly difficult to learn um, systems of um, of hiring and um, policies and procedures and um, and budgets. You know, we're always working on multiple budgets at any one time as we're waiting for Congress. Like right now, we're waiting for Congress to approve our budget that started in October. And because we are operating under continuing resolution, we are using our budget from last fiscal, fiscal year. So we don't yet know if or when a new budget will be approved. And we're just submitting our budget for the following fiscal year, even though we don't have a budget for this fiscal year. That's all very new to me and very surprising. Um, one of my um, most amazing surprises at the National Gallery was the tours I had of some of our special collections. And um, um, we, we have an incredible library with a uh, visual collection as well as rare books uh, that I actually didn't know about and um, enjoyed finding out some of those treasures. And then uh, in our works on paper collection, particularly um, the old master drawings took my breath away. And of course, they're objects that are so precious, um, they can't always be out on view. So while I knew a lot of the uh, painting and sculpture collection, I didn't know the treasures there. So that was one of my most wonderful surprises. I can imagine that move from Minneapolis to DC weather-wise. Um, I have only ever been able to travel to Minneapolis in the summer uh, for just those reasons. Keep it that way. <laughs> May I ask you, um, one of our staff members, Beth Miller, asked um, about this question of inclusion. Um, you mentioned it at the start of the talk that, um, you know, you're looking at your staff, you're thinking about the collection. She asked, um, what staffing or initiatives does the uh, National Gallery have in place for expanding um, inclusivity? And I think this is, a, this is a question that you might think through locally, but all, also it is a question that museums worldwide are asking. Absolutely. Um... You know, I think the bad news is museums were slow to realize, um, to learn much about American demographics and how our public was changing. Um, but the good news is um, they've been quick to respond and I'm really proud of our field and the initiatives taken. And, and I think here at the gallery, it's, um, we're quite similar to many other institutions, I'm sure, like the work that you're doing, Courtney, which I admire very much. Um, we uh, hired our first um, uh, Chief Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging Officer, Mika G. Conway, who is um, working on a series of programs. You know, something I actually learned in Minneapolis is a lot of this work, you know, has to start within internal before you can then move externally and um, think more about your front facing work. So we are just starting all of that internally. Um, I'm you know, really pleased to say that I have had the opportunity to make some key hires in our leadership team um, and curatorial, and in doing so have added greater diversity. And um, I inherited a leadership team that was 100% white and mostly male, and we're now 60% women and 60% um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And it changes the conversation. I mean, you can, you can, um, you know, to, to, to do work today, um, you, you really have to have the, the generosity, the humility, the legitimacy, and the authenticity. It's those four things I think are, are critical for American museums to be able to really embrace and reflect changing America. And so uh, we're on that journey to, to build in those areas. And um, I'll just finish by saying that um, one of our next exhibitions will open in April and it's called Afro-Atlantic Histories. And it's a show developed in Brazil um, looking at the um, transatlantic uh, slave trade and the um, diaspora and it's historic uh, to contemporary work. It's really powerful, moving and empowering. So that's gonna be a great show. I completely agree with you. I, I saw the, the Brazilian uh, version of that exhibition, and I think that it will resonate well with your colleagues at NAMAC, for mm -hmm. whom their story about the transatlantic slave trade is rooted um, in the 16th century in Brazil. So there, is a, there will be connections that you will make you know, up and down the mall. Absolutely. This is yeah. great. Yeah. Um, 
I could I could talk to you for the rest of the day um, <laughs> and wish that we had more time, but unfortunately we are out of time. I want to thank you sincerely for coming and joining us and for delivering such a powerful and important message. Um, you've given us all, I think, so much to think about, and I hope that you will um, come and visit us in person um, in the coming months. I look forward to it, Courtney, and, and uh, I, I just want to close thanking you again for inviting me and saying what an absolute pleasure it is to have you as a partner uh, in the work. You are uh, an amazing person and already off and running at um, the British Art Center, and I look forward to our increased uh, partnerships and work together. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, may I invite our audience to join us again next week on Wednesday the 10th at 12 um, Eastern Standard Time for a conversation with um, our colleague, uh, Thelma Golden, the Director and Chief Curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, like Kaywin's talk today, I think Thelma will deliver an equally powerful and engaging uh, conversation for all. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day.